Hi, thanks so much for uh, having me here today to talk about the NYU training program in psychedelic psychotherapy. I want to thank uh, Kevin and Neil for uh, bringing everyone here together and all the people that have helped in this and also all the therapists and other people at NYU that have uh, contributed to our, our program. I'm going to talk today about a training program that's affiliated with an academic research program and working with people who have cancer. Uh, so this is not a talk about training to become a psychedelic psychotherapist for a broad population of people or for a non-clinical, a non-research population. We train to do a very specific thing um, in a very specific setting. I'm Jeffrey Gus. I am an investigator and the director of psychedelic psychotherapy training at the NYU uh, Psilocybin and Cancer Anxiety Project. Today, I'm going to divide my talk into three sections. The first is a little bit of a sort of an overview and a thought piece about what psychedelic psychotherapy is, who does it, how people train to become one, and where it is in our uh, Western culture. The second is the structure of the NYU training program, and the third and last part, uh, the goals of the training program. You might think that the goals would come first, but actually the goals for the training program evolved over the first year that we were uh, doing the training and doing the research because it wasn't entirely clear what we needed to learn and what we needed to do until we actually started to do it with subjects. So to begin, who does psychedelic psychotherapy today? What happens for a therapist and a patient during a psychedelic psychotherapy session? And what are the theories? Are there theories that we could say underlie a psychedelic psychotherapy process? And what does the person do in order to become one? So in thinking about how to address this question, I uh, just decided to work with four different kinds of therapists or people who engage in a therapeutic way with uh, uh, participants or subjects or seekers or individuals uh, that offer some kind of psychedelic psychotherapy. And there are four categories that I'd like to talk about. Uh, the shaman, the neo-shaman, the meditation adept, and the palliative care psychotherapist or the psychodynamic psychotherapist. Now I'm going to talk about each category and each one of these categories, as I'm sure the people in this room know, is a very diverse, complicated group of people and it's uh, really wrong to say, okay, shamans are this way or neo-shamans are that way. So I'm going to offer some generalizations, which may even sound like stereotypes to some people, but uh, uh, I ask you to bear with me because I'm going to try to bring out some principles about what it is that we are training people to do at NYU, uh, the limitations that we have, the opportunities that we have, and how we are different and in some ways similar to uh, each of these four categories. Shamanism is uh, humankind's earliest and longest lasting healing, psychotherapeutic and religious tradition. The core function and one of the core theories underlying shamanism is communication with the spirit world. The shaman interacts with unseen mysterious forces. So right off the bat, we have a kind of discourse which is prohibited in uh, Western medical settings. If you say to someone, I want to help this patient by giving them this medicine, or I'm going to take this medicine, which is going to allow me into, their, into the spirit world where I can communicate with spirits and help solve their problem, uh, you're not going to get very far, you're not going to get any referrals, and you're really going to be considered to be not even a fringe player in an academic medical setting. You're going to be considered a kook, and you're not going to be taken seriously. And I'm going to repeat again and again, we are an academic research program in a medical setting. Uh, we have our little our place uh, that, we've, that we've landed and we're trying very hard to make certain that we continue to be welcomed and taken seriously in that setting. So we, we can't be all things to all people and I think that there are certainly ways that some psychedelic psychotherapists would say what we're doing is you know, misses the mark in terms of what the general practice would be. But we're doing what we're doing where we're doing it. The shaman enters a trance state in an altered state of consciousness, sometimes with the drug, other times without. The shaman experiences soul or, sp soul or spirit leaving the body and journeying into other realms. And this is quite a literal use of language within shamanism, that the soul leaves, journeys, does something, communicates, doesn't make some kind of a deal, negotiates or retrieves a soul and brings it back. The shaman commands, intercedes and communes with spirits for the benefit of the individual or possibly for the tribe. 
So again, we're quite distant from、uh, the way that Western medicine thinks about psychotherapy and, in particular, medical therapy. There is a commonality, though, between the shaman and the psychoanalyst. Both suffer from a malady which is defined by and cured by a particular practice. Everybody who becomes a psychoanalyst has a condition which is, by definition, if not healed, certainly treated and ameliorated by the practice that the psychoanalyst is、uh, learning himself or herself. And the same is true for the shaman. So,、uh, the shaman and the psychoanalyst share the wounded healer paradigm. I had many, many slides before this one,、uh, and in the interest of time, I pared them down. But I wanted to include this one、uh, because it brings quite a profound、uh, aspect、uh, to bear, which I'm going to talk about through today's talk, and that is the culmination of the shamanic quest. Shamanic training program is a very extensive program; it usually takes a number of years. Occasionally, it's brief, but commonly, it takes a number of years. And there is a confrontation with death, and this is experienced quite literally as a death of the individual, a death of the soul, a death of the body. Body with transformation and rebirth. These themes are not heard very often、uh, in how medicines work with people who are suffering from anxiety. But for the NYU therapists,、uh, our training involved turning our attention to the theme of death and transformation again and again and again. Because so much in our psychotherapy training, we think of the patient as leaving us and having a long life to live. Leaving us with an open-ended、uh, potential for using what they've learned and using the transformations that have happened to them in our work. But in order to be therapists in this study, we had to learn to face death, think about our own death, and think in a very unblinking way、uh, about the death of people who came to us for help and people who had cancer. Now, I don't need to tell people in this room that、uh, there often are psychedelic plants that are part of shamanic training. The training may involve taking psychedelic medicines, and may involve taking a lot of psychedelic medicines. And the practice may be either—I mean, the、uh, the sacrament, the psychedelic may be taken by the shaman or the patient or both in the healing process. And there was already has been a question about who takes the substance and who knows what.、Uh, In shamanism, sometimes the shaman, sometimes the patient take the medicine, but certainly in training, the shaman takes it.、Uh, a similarity between shamanic training and、uh, Western training is that there are culturally bound narratives of illness and healing. In other words, a shaman may be a marginal figure in society, but they are a well-recognized figure, like a neurosurgeon. Not that many people actually go to a neurosurgeon, but we all know what a neurosurgeon is. We know what a certain neurosurgeon does, and. There might come a time in which we need one, so it's actually a fringe person in most people's lives, but a、uh, an idea or some a、um, a presence in lives. And again, there is a highly ritualized, strong respect for tradition. In psychedelic shamanism, plants oops, are considered a gift of the gods. They're either the mediator between human beings and gods, or the the the、uh, psychedelic plant may be the god. Itself, or himself, or herself, and the plants contain spirit power. In, psych in psychedelic research and in psychiatric research, molecules are considered inert substances. They're dangerous. They are in danger. We have an 800-pound safe that protects the psilocybin in our study, and it's always curious to me, like whether it's protected, it's being protected from us, or we're being protected from it. But in one case or another, this huge safe is required to keep this tiny bottle of medicine. Uh, and in, that's the way it is on First Avenue, 26th Street. But in other places, they grow out, you know, in the wild. For anybody who wants to go, pick them and take them. So this is a summary of what the indigenous shaman brings. The neo shaman is somebody who's more a member of a contemporary Western society. And the core text on neo shamanism is、uh, Michael Harner's *The Way of the Shaman*. The neo shamanic beliefs include direct contact with the spirit world, including. Uh, entering altered states through psychedelic medicine. There's skepticism towards monotheistic religions. There's skepticism towards traditional allopathic medicine, in particular psychiatry, and usually a good bit of skepticism towards、uh, the scientific method as a way of knowing. The psychedelic sitter or the neo shaman is generally naturally emergent, self-selected, as opposed to、uh, a shaman who is、uh, sort of. Selected by the community, or whose qualities as a shaman are emergent, and there isn't always a voluntary choice for each person that's called into shamanism. The validity to function as a neo shaman or a psychedelic sitter is based on personal experience with psychedelics, and often little more. And there is a lack of a formal, widely accepted, culturally bound apprenticeship process. 
The neo shaman is often allied with yoga, chakra healing, Chinese medicine or acupuncture, astrology, or a broad variety of other non traditional uh, healing mechanisms. The neo shaman <clears throat> or the psychedelic sitter is a culturally bound, a culturally deviant identity. If you are a psychedelic sitter, you may be able to talk about that in a room like this, but there are many, many worlds in which if you talk about that, you're going to be held in question. And I like this picture because, uh, you know, this woman could be at Burning Man in a tent, or she could be a junior league uh, uh, participant, or she could be both. And she could be a. Um, uh, a psychedelic sitter and a neo shaman. You can't tell by looking at her. And in most shamanic, in most cultures that have shamanism as a central healing mechanism, the shaman is not a hidden identity. We have a bridge between neo shamanism and psychiatry, and that is Stan Groff. Oh, I thought I put his two books in. Uh, looks like I didn't. Uh, and. Stan Groff's writings are very, very interesting, and he brings forward uh, the idea of death and rebirth. His perinatal uh, matrices, being in the womb, the contractions prior to birth, enter, exiting through the birth canal, and then being born, apply in a metaphorical way to four discrete processes in uh, human transformation that he, uh, that he uses when he does psychedelic work. But again, we see the theme of death and rebirth coming forward. Being a neo-shaman is a prohibited discourse in medical circles. In other words, you really can't talk about being a psychedelic sitter if you want to be taken uh, seriously as an academic researcher or as a participant in uh, academic research. And this is one of my pet peeves, if you get the pun. Uh, this is a PET scan. Uh, it's much more comfortable for people to think about scans like this, although in my opinion, a PET scan is just the slightest bit less metaphoric about how the mind works than um, chakra healing or acupuncture meridians. So then we have a review of neo-shamans. Mindfulness. The mindfulness adept or the meditation practitioner or the meditation teacher offers something very specific that we used in our study, and that is the skill of mindfulness. Meditation teaches a technique for developing mindfulness, which is characterized by two main qualities, the self-regulation of attention and the focus on the immediate experience. The focus on the immediate experience carries with it a particular kind of orientation, and that is an orientation of curiosity, openness, and acceptance, working against the absence of curiosity. Oh, I've already seen that. I already know that. Openness, no, I don't want to feel that, and acceptance, no, I can't bear feeling that. Each one of these habits of mind is countered through the technique of mindfulness. Mindfulness is not blissing out and um, uh, having only good thoughts. It is a kind of a relationship with one's own thoughts, and this is a central technique that the therapists use in uh, uh, the research program. Mindfulness is a core practice in our medically based psychedelic psychotherapy. The mindfulness practitioner recognizes that altered states of consciousness have the capacity to facilitate a transformation. However, in many uh, advanced meditative practices, there is a deep skepticism of drug induced altered states of consciousness as less legitimate, as not leading to a religious life, just a religious experience, and just being uh, not kosher in some important ways. Um, so this is a review of some of the qualities of mindfulness and the same. And the fourth I'm going to talk about is the palliative care therapist and the psychodynamic therapist. We have in our study three two hour preparatory sessions before the first psychedelic uh, or placebo session. Then there's seven weeks during which there's six more hours of therapy. Then after the second session, another six hours. And we had to uh, come up with some clarity about what we were going to do during all that time when we were working with people with cancer-related anxiety. And if you look at the palliative care literature, one of the core processes that is promoted in addition to mindfulness is the development of meanings and narratives regarding illness, cancer, and death. And this is, was a great asset uh, when I discovered it in the palliative care literature because it was new to me when I started working with this project. There's a similarity between the original radical idea of psychoanalysis that uh, Freud brought. It has been so changed and so, uh, <clears throat> so, uh, so developed in so many different ways that some people forget that Freud's hovering, free floating attention is actually quite similar to the meditative mindfulness that I spoke about uh, you know, just a couple of minutes ago. Also, in Freud's original psychoanalysis, there was a search for truth, authenticity, noetic awareness, 
and surrender. And noetic awareness of the truth is knowing and feeling the truth without a need for objective proof or external validation. Mindfulness in palliative care anchors the individual in reality, in uh, immediacy, and groundlessness, which includes the inevitability of change, letting go, and the tolerance of intense emotions. One of the uh, qualities between palliative care and psychoanalytic therapy um, shamanism is the intense uh, in focus on self-observation by the therapist of their own feelings, thoughts, breath, and bodily sensation in terms of uh, maintaining presence and also being able to be uh, most therapeutic to the patient. The therapist's own psychotherapy is an integral part of the training process. And importantly, this is quite consistent with Western medical ethical norms and standards and is easily accepted. And we have a two slides of review. So I'm going to go on to talk about the structure of the program. I modeled the, uh, the training program uh, on the tr psychoanalytic uh, training, which is composed of three essential components. The first is didactic coursework. In psychoanalytic training, you have years of articles, chapters, books, and discussion studying the writings of other people. You have three, four, or five carefully con uh, supervised control cases and a personal psychoanalysis. So if you think about modeling uh, psychedelic psychotherapy training on this, we have a problem. And the problem is that personal work with psychedelic medicines in a supervised, regulated way is not something which at this stage in the evolution of the, the psychedelic research renaissance that we can have. There is no legitimate way that we can require therapists to undergo psychedelic psychotherapy and really no legitimate way in which we can even talk about it. So it is a prohibited discourse and all I can say is that it leaves this aspect of our training program uh, incomplete. There are some substitutes that we considered. Uh, we could in have encouraged our therapists to undergo secret entheogen experience and not talk about it, and uh, that seems really bogus to me. We talked about uh, holotropic breathwork, but this is not uh, really the same thing as psychedelic work, and uh, we wanted our therapists to feel free to pursue whatever kinds of uh, meditative, spiritual, transformative experiences that they chose to pursue their own uh, uh, spiritual path and not set a certain kind of standard for what it should be. Also, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, in August 2010, uh, MAPS was successful in developing a program by which the therapists in an MDMA study for PTSD were, uh, uh, will be allowed to uh, take MDMA as part of their training uh, as a study program looking at uh, the psychological effects on healthy volunteers. But this is really not part of our agenda at, uh, at NYU at this time. So I thought about what I might substitute for it. And what I found, uh, what I developed, actually doesn't really substitute for direct experience with psychedelics in terms of what that might offer a therapist. But it does offer something which I think is of real value to people. And <clears throat> that is the experiential diet sessions. Now, some of you may know, but all of you may not know, that the therapy that we do with, with uh, subjects in the study is done by therapy teams. Each person in our study is assigned a therapy diet. Usually that's been a male-female diet, although recently we have had uh, a male-male diet. Um, and we wondered what the communication process, what the development process for the therapy diet uh, you know, should look like and would be. So I developed uh, these uh, dyadic sessions. And so this, well, this is an overview of the three components of the NYU training program. Didactic, reading, classes, articles, the experiential diet, sessions and supervision. And I'll talk about each of these individually. The didactic first. Uh, the didactic coursework occurred over a nine-month period. All the therapists participated in it. There were 18 sessions over about nine months. For many of us, it was a crash course in, in uh, palliative care psychotherapy. Only Tony Bassas, who is a palliative care specialist and a pain medicine specialist, uh, had been working with individuals who have cancer, who have pain, um, and so he was well experienced in uh, palliative care. But it was new for all the rest of us, and it was quite eye-opening to me to study palliative care, to find articles that I thought would allow the therapists to quickly get up to, get up to speed in the methods, techniques, and theory for it. We read one academic journal article or book per session, and in class we talked about uh, how to apply what we were learning 
about palliative care therapy to uh, what we imagine psychedelic therapy would be, because our training occurred before we actually had started working with our, uh, our subjects. And it happened here in our study room. So we started reading uh, Ira Bayok's article, The Meaning and Value of Death, and this is actually one of the most moving and touching sessions I think that we had. Uh, this brought forward so many um, reactions in the therapist, uh, things that we had not thought about, not talked about, and discovered that we had, uh, in a way, like so many other therapists, had a subtle, maybe not so subtle, uh, denial of the impact and meaning of death, our own death, the death of our, sub of our patients, uh, and the role of death and the denial of death in the therapy that we do. I had never learned to take a spiritual history, uh, and so we read a couple of articles uh, on that, in particular Christina Puchalski's article on spirituality and the care of patients at the end of life, and we each practiced doing uh, spiritual histories and taking them on one another. We read Bill Breitbart's article, which gave uh, a very nice introduction to existential psychotherapy with its focus on freedom and death, and the denial of freedom and death, as well as logotherapy by Viktor Frankl. We studied the historical perspectives on the work that we're doing, reading Stan Groff and Joan Halifax's chapter, The History of Psychedelic Therapy with the Dying, and Pankey's uh, classic article, The Psychedelic Mystical Experience in the Human Encounter with Death. Um, there were a number of interesting articles that, we read, that I looked at, and this is one of the best, looking at uh, spontaneously occurring or evoked mystical experiences um, with people who have cancer. And Alison uh, Vita, I think is how you should pronounce her name, uh, works in palliative care, does not work with psychedelics, but looked at spontaneously occurring and um, evoked mystical experiences with people who have cancer, trying to help figure out what makes them happen, what facilitates them, what shuts them down, but most importantly, what's important about integrating them into the overall psychotherapeutic approach to uh, the individual with cancer. We studied mindfulness and breathing practices. Again, this uh, article by Ann Bruce focuses not just on learning how to teach a breathing practice to your patient, but how to participate yourself in the, the palliative care work as a form of meditation, tracking your own um, awareness and mindfulness as well as that of your patient, and realizing that the separation between your mindfulness and your attention to your patient's mindfulness um, that the barrier between subject and object you know, begins to break down. And I think we see here a bit of a connection to the breakdown between the subject and object that we saw in traditional um, indigenous shamanism. When I studied uh, palliative care, about a third of the articles that I found were about burnout. And I, I learned how quickly people who practice uh, palliative care uh, burn out and find the work unbearable. There are a lot of articles about preventing burnout uh, and how to maintain yourself as a practitioner. In order to figure out what to do during those long sessions, I mean those long therapy sessions in between the first and second uh, experimental medicine sessions, uh, we used two forms of therapy, two kinds of structured therapy. One, meaning-making therapy, and the other, life review therapy. Uh, both of these help look at the person's life as a whole, beginning with birth, moving to cancer, ending when that person imagines their death is going to occur, looking at how they coped, goals, disappointments, strengths, coping strategies, vulnerabilities, uh, creating a new and different narrative about this to help the person cope with both their present and what they were going to do with the, uh, the remainder of their life. Uh, and the Life Review Interviewing Guide uh, by uh, Beecham was a really great article and really, really interesting in terms of uh, how to work with the stories that, that were being given. Not just to take them in in a kind of empathic attunement to them, but also how to work with them and give something uh, back to the, to the patient or the subject that really felt useful and creative and not simply holding what they were telling you. Uh, we had some guest lecturers. Bill Richards from uh, Johns Hopkins came and spent a weekend with us and uh, we still refer to the notes from, from that weekend as really quite a brilliant and moving and touching experience spending time with him. Um, I learned a great deal about 
uh, how to conduct the sessions, how to interpret what happens, how to deal with problems, how to prepare ourselves for it. So it was really a great, inspiring experience. Scott Kellogg from the Department of Psychology at NYU gave us a talk on transformational chair work, and uh, Oliver Williams and Emily Horowitz gave us a guest lecture on uh, holotropic breath work. So next, I'm going to talk about the experiential dyad sessions. There were six experiential dyad sessions. There are eight therapists in the study, there are four dyads, and each dyad was, was fixed. They were uh, invited and actually required to complete these six sessions. The sessions lasted one and a half to two hours, and only the therapists were present during the experiential dyad sessions. Each session had a, uh, had a defined theme, although a free-flowing discussion occurred afterwards, uh, after be you know, beginning with the, the theme of the session, um, at least it certainly did in mine, and I think it did in, in other people's uh, dyads too. After the third and the sixth session, there was supervision. Uh, with the person who was designated to be the supervisor. I was not the supervisor for all of the dyad processes because there was just too, many, too much supervision to do, and uh, we felt that it would be useful for people to talk you know, in a way that felt comfortable and in a structure that was, had some flexibility uh, for who wanted to work with whom. The goal of the dyad sessions was to establish a close communication and close connection between the therapists and to discover similarities and differences, not just in their therapeutic styles, but also uh, what, they, um, uh, what they thought and felt about the afterlife, about heaven and hell and so forth. Uh, you know, I, I, when I was selecting the pictures for this, I didn't think that much about uh, this particular one and it seemed a little cutesy. Uh, but just last night when I was reviewing my notes, I, I noticed that uh, you know, when you play this game of speaking with a tin can, who is listening and who is speaking is very well defined. These people cannot have a, a, uh, you know, a conversation. Who's listening and who's speaking is defined, and this actually was one of the ways that uh, the sessions were structured. I invited the therapist to speak as if they were the patient, or the subject, I keep calling them the patient, the subject in the study, talking about their internal uh, experience, and for the other to function as a therapist and practice the kind of active listening skills uh, that we were going to be using with our subject. The first session uh, was about early memories as well as contemporary experiences of death and losses. I invited people to talk about whether as a child they had family members that died, uh, pets, friends, patients, parents that had died. Uh, also, early memories of uh, awareness that you yourself are going to die when that first came about, uh, and the reaction or the defense or the denial or whatever it is that came up around that really frightening uh, awareness. The second session was to talk about experiences with profound spiritual, mystical states and entheogen experiences. Now, many of the people in the room here will probably easily recognize what this is a picture of. These are people from uh, North America or uh, Europe who have traveled to South America to uh, engage in uh, ayahuasca retreat and have experience with that, uh, that sacrament and, and that, uh, that healing system. This was a place in the privacy of the dyad sessions. People were free to talk about what they had done, what they had not done, what they were afraid of, what they wanted, what they didn't have, what they did have, uh, so that this, in this you know, private and confidential setting, there was a freedom to be quite open. I also invited each therapist to talk about their experiences as a sitter, if they had done psychedelic therapy with people, or if they had had experiences with psychedelics and worked with the sitter, what that was like, what they didn't like, how it worked, how they understood it, and how their role in the study was different or similar to uh, what they experienced uh, themselves. And also to talk about uh, you know, whether they work with shamans. The third session, uh, the therapists were invited to talk about their experience of pain and suffering and family members, friends, and patients. This is different from death and loss. This is about being in the presence of ongoing uh, anguish, pain, and suffering. Also, for each person to talk about experiences with their own cancer, or uh, family members, or friends, patients that had cancer, or other terminal conditions, as well as disfigurement and body failure. I have not been uh, worked, had not worked in the inpatient unit for many, many years uh, before working with this. And although in my medical training and in uh, 
to my residency, I saw a lot of very, very sick people. It had been a long time since I'd been with somebody who was really quite ill. And often as a doctor, when you work with somebody who's really quite ill, there's a technological or a diagnostic or, or treatment intervention that stands between you and real empathic immersion with what the patient is going through. You're prescribing something, you're relieving pain with a pill, you're diagnosing what's making them hurt so much and trying to relieve it. And the, the job of empathic immersion with your subject, who might be in you know, agony or in some kind of anguish, required a kind of tolerance that uh, brought a new, sort of brought a new uh, challenge to me and I think to, to a number of the, uh, the therapists in the study. The fourth session was focused on near-death experiences whether the therapist had ever had a suicide attempt or had suicidal ideation, uh, whether they had, a, in their spiritual practice, had ever had uh, an experience of dying, body, de body decomposition uh, and uh, transformation, including these experiences that might have occurred through entheogens. Also, I encouraged people to talk about uh, being ill or having an accident or having any kind of near-death experience so that the, the, uh, the, the therapist would know what, the, uh, what their partner was really about when it comes to these real life and death issues. The fifth session was devoted to personal beliefs about heaven and hell. Some of our therapists believed quite literally in a certain kind of afterlife. Others had absolutely no belief or no sense that uh, any conscious, the consciousness lives on uh, in any way after uh, uh, you know, we stop living. Encourage them to talk about their religious history, work that they'd uh, done with uh, religious or deeply spiritual patients, and what happened to them growing up, whether they were alienated or estranged, or perhaps even still a deep practitioner of some kind of organized uh, religion. And the sixth session was devoted to personal experiences with extreme emotional states during psychotherapy. Whether we had uh, the therapist had worked with people who were terrorized, grief-stricken, rageful, people who had bizarre, altered somatic states, somatic hallucinations, uh, or agitated states, and experiences in friends, loved ones, family members that had been in such states. Uh, we did not experience this. We, we really anticipated that there might be quite, quite extreme behavior coming from the subject in the study, and there certainly has been crying, fear, anger, a lot of intense emotion, but we've not had any disruptive experiences which uh, in any way felt uh, you know, anxiety provoking to the therapist. And quite the contrary, the emotional outbursts have been deeply moving and really, I think, very healing for the, uh, for the subjects and really profound for the therapist as well. So the lived experience of the experiential dyad sessions. The topics uh, that I set up were really just a starting off point and people went in all different directions in their dyad sessions. The supervision was necessary in order to track how the dyad was doing and whether they were progressing along and what was required, but there was a subtle intrusiveness, I think, at times by the, su okay, by the supervisor, uh, and it does not adequately uh, parallel the personal uh, analysis that's central to psychoanalytic training. So I'm gonna close by reviewing the goals of the training program. The first goal, developing core competence in the methods of palliative care psychotherapy in individuals with advanced cancer. The second, developing a close, trusting, flexible bond between the co-therapists. Third, the development of the capacity to support a mystical or spiritual experience in the subject and relate these to the illness and the mortality that's facing the individual. This was really something quite new for me. Uh, although I had I have been involved in uh, spiritual practice for a long time, uh, working with it in patients and applying it to uh, transformation in their life was something that was new for me and something with, for which I'd had a kind of um, a distance in terms of the practice that I had of psychotherapy and what I was doing myself. Learning how to recognize it and support it in patients and use it creatively it like opened up a new way of talking and helping the patient and we had to uh, not only learn how to do that but also relate it to cancer and uh, the fact that the individual was uh, going to be dying of cancer and perhaps in the near, in the near future. We wanted to develop skills in how to respond in a very specific way to difficult, complicated, or disruptive experiences. We talked for long periods of time about touching, whether it was right to touch someone or not touch them, and do we need to ask them for permission? Uh, 
during the sessions and after all the talking that we did about it, uh, I think there's been a significant amount of hugging that's gone on when people were in extreme states and I think that everybody's all the better for it. So we developed these skills but uh, I think that people did what came naturally in terms of uh, caring about uh, people when they were in, in uh, rough shape or in extreme states um, and it's not, been, it's not been a big problem. Uh, the go another goal was to integrate personal experiences with mystical states and your identity as uh, a spiritual seeker or an entheogen user with your identity as a palliative care and transpersonal therapist. Uh, there was a surprising amount of uh, countertransference that emerged uh, both in our work group and in sessions with, uh, actually it's not surprising um, uh, that it occurred, but there was, a, there, there was a lot of it that occurred and we learned to work with that. Uh, and lastly, developing acceptance of the restrictions imposed by the fact that this is a research protocol. As I said at the beginning, uh, this is a training program in psychedelic psychotherapy for people with cancer in an academic research program. There are many things that you would not do if this were outside of a research setting or if the individuals didn't have cancer. So, you know, when you become a psychoanalyst, you're free to go out and treat all kinds of people and you're not trained to be a, a psychoanalyst for this particular kind of condition. Uh, but I wanted us to focus on what these subjects needed in this setting at this time. And that's the, the training program that, uh, that we developed. There were a number of things that we had to do that felt intrusive into what would ideally be uh, the, the most um, empathically and carefully crafted psychedelic therapy session for patients. There were also things that we, that we couldn't do that we would, would like to have done. All of these had to be um, tailored in order to maintain the integrity of the research program because in a way we had, we had subjects in our study but the most delicate and the most fragile subject of all uh, turns out to be the study itself. The study itself requires a tremendous amount of caretaking, tender loving care, attention, sometimes it seems like it almost needs uh, life support <laughs> to keep going because of all the challenges that come to it. And so uh, there's really not much, not many days go by that we don't have to remember that we're not just psychedelic therapists, we are researchers in an academic setting. Uh, I brought a lot of this together uh, in a training manual which has uh, you know, the didactic components, the experiential components, uh, described the preparatory sessions with the subject and the family, the, experiential, uh, the experimental sessions with the subjects, and some guidelines on how to conduct uh, integrative sessions with the subject and family. So some long-term questions include uh, questions that are the kind of things that are asked in departments of psychiatry and academic medicine whenever you offer a new form of therapy. If you offer a new form of therapy, you have to define what are the core processes that define that therapy? What makes that a particular form of therapy that's distinct from other therapies? Is it possible to establish standards of practice? You know, that phrase may sound very boring and uh, uh, foreign to people who are not involved in academic uh, uh, research settings or academic training settings, but it's all over the place in departments of psychiatry. How do you say, okay, this person is trained as a psychedelic psychotherapist and they've met the standards of practice. They're doing what a competent psychedelic therapist should do and this person isn't. This person is behaving outside those boundaries and setting those boundaries and deciding like who's meeting the, making the cut and who's not is what um, uh, training programs, uh, these are questions that you have to answer. We need to think about whether kind of transference is understood in any way that's different uh, than any other form of therapy. Are two therapists really necessary for, the, uh, for this uh, process? Is the male-female dyad tradition one that's valid and should be maintained? Is it possible to evaluate the clinician's spiritual maturity? You know, when you train to be an analyst, uh, your supervisors will say, yes, this person seems to have, you know, achieved an analytic process, they know how to handle it, and they're mature in an analytic way. Is it possible to say that about another person's spirituality? Uh, because it seems to me that spiritual maturity should be a prerequisite, not a prerequisite, but, but a, an accompaniment of being a psychedelic therapist. A big question that intrigues me is how character structure affects uh, response to psychedelics and psychedelic therapy and how do the therapist values and psychological orientation theories affect their work. So 
As I guess you can see, I really like looking at、uh, at images, and because I, I think that they convey some、uh, something that the words can't.、And、when I saw this picture, I thought it was really quite quite funny, and captured something、um, about、uh, the way that I think many people see see our program.、Uh, ours is not a, sci- a psilocybin research study; it is a palliative care study that is assisted by. One dose of psilocybin. The person has two、uh, experimental sessions. One is placebo, and one is active drug. So the concept that this is all about what happens inside this molecule is, you know, really not not accurate because there is so much work that happens with each subject that does not involve the actual ingestion of the substance. On the other hand, psilocybin pervades every aspect of the study. It gives us the way to build a bridge and to enter medical discourse with psilocybin on our on our、uh, our lips. To talk about it, to bring up the topic, to explain to doctors and nurses and social workers、uh, why we think this might be helpful to them. We go into the most traditional of Western medical settings and talk about it. So before I talked about a prohibited medical discourse, this study is a way that we are making psilocybin and psychedelic therapy part of、uh, an accepted medical discourse. So, as, as I mentioned before, there are very few actual encounters between the human being and the psychedelic agent, and yet the spirit of the agent pervades all aspects of the、uh, of the process, from the initial phone call throughout the entire process with us, and even the follow up afterwards. I also just found this this、uh, very funny slide last night, and.、Uh, Wondered whether the brain was generating、uh, God and Adam, or God and Adam had generated the brain, or whether these were just two among many、uh, metaphors that we can use to think about, you know, what happens up here.、Uh, but the goal of this project and the goal of the training is to bring together and to create a discourse between these two worlds: the worlds of academic medicine and the world of psychedelic medicines, and in particular, the suffering that's caused by cancer, death, and dying. And the themes of the altered narrative that we try to bring to、uh, the subjects also, I think, have come about for all of the therapists in the study, and that is the importance of having a sense of contribution to other people, the importance of forgiveness and acceptance of each other and ourselves for all of the challenges and mistakes and hardships and、um, difficulties that come our way, the sacredness of life and each moment of life, preparing for experiences of death. And rebirth, and a moment-to-moment appreciation of、uh, each moment of life. And with that, I'll bring it to a close. Thank you. Questions. Thank you, Jeff. Beautiful.、Um, questions, Miss. Hi,、um, my name is Dr. Deborah Goldberg, and a while ago, I was boarded as a medical oncologist, and I'm also a medical hypnotist, so that's my framework. And my, I'm really glad you guys are doing this study. I think it's really important that it be done. But my question has to do with is. Psychoanalytic training in this whole thing, a surrogate for maturity and discipline, or is there something about psychoanalytic training that's really necessary, to, in your opinion, to be able to be somebody to evaluate this data? Training somebody to to evaluate. In other words, is the、um, is the psychoanalytic training a necessary part? Of looking how to do this kind of therapy, we're using the testing the possibility of using psilocybin to treat cancer, near-death anxiety. Do you need the psychoanalytic training, qua training, or do you need it because you get the right people out of doing it? That's really my question.、Um, I think it's a great question.、Uh, I don't think you need psychoanalytic training per se. Uh, but I do think that you need extensive training as a psychotherapist, 
I think you need to know how to work with all kinds of people in all kinds of extreme states, how to work with transference and countertransference, have a sense of your own, uh, of yourself as a therapeutic instrument in working with people. We have people who are social workers, psychologists, family therapists, some people work in a, in a family network, uh, you know, strategic, structural family therapy model, others are more psychodynamic. It isn't what the training is as much as having had experience in sitting with a lot of people in pain over time uh, and knowing who you are and the process that you believe in. Because uh, if you know the distinction between psycholytic and psychedelic psychotherapy, I think our subjects have a combination of both. In many ways, they have a loosening of the defenses and the kind of aggression that Groff and others wrote about in terms of uh, psycholytic psychotherapy. And when those defenses loosen and the person is in a kind of a psychodynamic session with you, you have to know what you're doing, why you're doing it, how to take a person from here to there. And the theory that you have doesn't matter as much as your confidence and ability to do that. So you have to spend a lot of time as a therapist. And I don't think just doing a lot of psychedelics um, yourself makes you able to do that. It might make you able to interpret in one session uh, something or know how to understand or identify with what your subject is going through. But, you know, as I said, so much of what happens is about palliative care therapy. So it's mostly about being um, settled as a therapist and being ready to understand and work with what happens in the sessions. Other questions, please. Front. Just to go along with what you were just discussing, what sort of people have entered the program and succeeded? Like, what were their backgrounds as far as the people that have been trained in the palliative care program? You mean the therapists? Yes, the therapists. Um, all of the therapists are either psychologists, social workers, um, family therapists, psychiatrists. So everybody's been through a training program in some kind of psychotherapy and had extensive experience in working with people outside of psychedelic psychotherapy. So this is sort of an integration of, of an interest and belief in psychedelics with pre-existing uh, uh, identity as a therapist. Does, does that answer your question? Okay. Room. Um, yes. I wondered if you followed your subjects until death. Did you follow your subjects all the way through to, to their death? Yes. Not all of them have died, but all of them um, uh, have been followed, and uh, some treatment. I mean, the the research itself ends at nine months, and if it appears clinically indicated, there's no rule against the therapist and the, and the person continuing to see each other in some form, but there's a structured uh, interaction with them, and there's also a sort of compassionate clause in which we're able to see people in ways that seem you know, clinically indicated. We had uh, one subject that lived in uh, California who flew uh, to New York for his sessions, and about uh, like three or four weeks before he died, we were really fortunate enough because a very generous person at, uh, at Bluestone uh, we supported uh, his, co his therapist, which was me, and my co-therapist, and our research coordinator to, uh, to fly out there and see him in his uh, uh, home. So we were able to see him just a few weeks before he died. Well, I've got it a couple of... <laughs> so I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, could you tell us the, um, the, the other kinds of doses of psilocybin you were giving? And also, I was wondering how you were going to be assessing the, the quality of their psychedelic experience. Uh, it was 34 uh, milligrams per kilo, 0.34 milligrams per kilogram. So it's done on a milligram per kilogram basis, and each person gets the exact same dosage in in their session. Uh, people are extensively evaluated through a broad variety of questionnaires before during and after. They're given the APZ questionnaire and a, a, a number of other um, instruments. I just can't, I can't uh, uh, list them all for you, so sorry. Other questions? Um, sir. Excuse me, could you pass this down? Uh, so you mentioned that there was uh, a bit of uh, uh, counter-transference 
And you also mentioned that you have a, uh, uh, an agent, or somebody who goes with the, uh, the patient throughout the process from the beginning to the end. And I was wondering if you examined at all the, uh, the therapeutic alliance and if your thoughts on that and its role within uh, psychedelic uh, research. That's a big question. Um, examined, yes. Studied in a research way, no. All of our studies uh, are focused on the experience of the subject. Even the person, uh, even the family members that uh, uh, we work with are observing the subject in the study. So we have no systematic way of looking at what the therapists are going through or what the family members or loved ones uh, of the subject are going through. But examined, yes, that's something that we work, at, work with in supervision. And the transference and kind of transference, for the most part, is similar to other, pro other ways that transference and kind of transference emerge. The patients can see you as either father, mother, their kids. Uh, since there's two therapists, there often is a kind of split, and one person becomes uh, warm and caring, and the other one is cool and distant. You know, all, all kinds of processes like that happen. Uh, the, one of the, the subjects that I work with uh, was young, and he was, uh, you know, younger than I am. And uh, he's a, uh, a gay man who was very muscular. And throughout the time I worked with him, you know, I saw him shrink and shrink. Uh, and you know, watching this happen, I think evoked a reaction in me that was different than if my subject had been a 75-year-old woman with cervical cancer, because my identification with him was so much stronger. Uh, and, you know, in one of our sessions, he had to catheterize himself. And seeing that, being present for that, and seeing the pain and anguish and suffering of this, of this process uh, was wrenching. It was, it was really painful to watch that. Uh, and for him to not do that alone, but to do that with somebody that he had a relationship with, it was a complex transference, counter-transference uh, event for us. Does that answer your question? Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Um, I have a question. I think your therapist training program is fantastic. And so I, I wonder, though, do you videotape your sessions, and is there some way for you to kind of verify or give feedback on whether people are following the principles that you've tried to teach them? Right. And then secondly, in the MDMA PTSD therapy training program, we've gotten, as you know, permission from FDA to give MDMA to therapists as part of their training. Are you going to be exploring trying to get permission like that to administer psilocybin to your therapist teams? Okay, so I, let me see if I can remember all the, all the questions. No, we don't have any videotaping uh, of uh, the process. We considered that, but we decided it would be uh, too intrusive for the subject. And the idea that they were being uh, recorded without any knowledge of what would happen to that recording would have a detrimental uh, and profound effect upon their freedom to be, say, do whatever it is that they were going through. Now, I know often, you know, people will say, well, I forgot about it after five minutes. I certainly, you know, heard that from patients when I used audio taping during my uh, analytic training. Uh, but as a group, we just decided to, to put that off. And to answer the second part of your question, no, we do not have a, uh, a plan in mind to uh, develop research similar to the uh, MDMA research. It's not a way that we're, uh, that we're leaning in terms of how we want to devote our resources, time, and energy right now. It's not that I don't think it's important. I do. Uh, but, you know, we're all volunteers, and we have uh, limited resources and limited time, and it's just not, not uh, made it to the top of the list in terms of projects that we want to pursue. So, no, I don't have any way of validating that people are following the principles except the supervisory process. This is something which is, you know, just beginning, and uh, you can't do everything all at, all at the beginning. It took, I think it would take uh, training, you know, more people and treating more subjects to really know more about, you know, what psychedelic therapy is, what these particular patients need, what therapists need, and so forth. It was a challenge to develop a training program for a kind of therapy that uh, was not really very much in existence yet. So it's sort of like getting the, not the cart before the horse, but like getting the saddle before the cart and the horse. Because you've got to like figure out exactly what it is that you think you're going to need before you actually need it. And we've been evolving it over time, the more subjects we treat. Thank you. I think we're really out of time for questions right now. And uh, please help me thank Jeff Gus.